morning. God bless you in the name of the Lord. We're going to, today, we're going to talk about grace. I told you we were going to pick a, pick a topic, so this has been, you know, we were on prayer, and now we're going to talk for a few minutes on grace. Um, and I want to um, just pick a couple of items. If you pull up the, the first meaning, because listen, there's grace, graceful. You can do something with grace and not even be godly. Right, right. A woman can walk down an aisle gracefully. Uh, uh, um, um, someone can hit a baseball gracefully. So there's, there's different types of grace. Then there's disgrace. Then we've, we all are familiar with the term greasy grace. The Brother Brandon brings that greasy grace. We're not going to talk about greasy grace yet, but we've got to bring it in. But we're going to talk about grace. Now, the word grace is uh, even from the Hebrew lexicon. There's one up above that, I think, isn't there, brothers? Should be. It's a, the Strong's number 2580. There we go. And it is favor. Charm, favor, grace, elegance, favor, and acceptance. So we're looking at favor, finding favor with God. And now, like I said before, don't think about disgrace and greasy grace. Let's think about grace just for a minute. See that word at the bottom? It says acceptance. Now, let's go to the uh, definition of grace in the Webster's Dictionary. And we see Brother Branham tells us, it is unmerited divine assistance. So when you put that divine in there, that has to be from God. Amen? Yeah. <clears throat> and it's not disgrace. It's not gracefully walking. It's not. It's grace. It's unmerited favor. You didn't do anything to get this. Now, this fits really good into the plan of redemption that we're preaching on, the eternal plan of redemption, because without this unmerited divine assistance, you and I are dead. Because we're born in sin, shaping in iniquity. We come to the world speaking lies, doomed, the prophet said, and on our way to hell. But look, unmerited divine assistance given to humans. Now, grace is given to human beings for their regeneration or sanctification. Think about that. Regeneration. Every one of us, Paul says, follow me in the regeneration or the regening or the new birth. There's a lot of people that are given grace, but they're not given this kind of grace because only children of God are given divine grace. Amen? Because what happens if you don't have the new birth, you're not a child of God. And it says this is a virtue coming from God. So look, like I said many times before, man never developed grace. It had to be developed by God. Because you and I are not gracious people to a degree. We're always pointing fingers. It's always this one's fault. It's always that one's fault. But divine grace comes from God. It's a virtue coming from God. He knew we would need it. And we need this right here very much. Divine assistance. Amen? Amen. So as we go up the statue of a perfect man, we need that divine assistance even after the new birth to get us... To where we're going, and look at this last one: approval. Without grace, we're not approved. Without grace, we're sinners, and we are sinners, but saved by grace. All right, everybody with me on that? And I want you to look. We're going to look at a couple of of uh, examples that are that are wonderful in the Bible. <clears throat> Let's go to Genesis six, verse eight. It says, but Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. There's only one man out of billions of people that found grace in the eyes of the Lord. In other words, he found acceptance. He found, now listen, there's one thing, it, if we say it's unmerited divine assistance given to humans, now, you must accept that. If it's in your regeneration, if it's in your new birth or your sanctification, you've got to accept it first. You've got to accept grace. If you don't accept grace, then it's not going to do you any good. Because if you don't accept grace, I, I, and I was reading in Job, 
If you read Job, if you read critical, the critical side of Job, he's a pretty self-righteous guy. I didn't do this, I didn't do that, I didn't do this, I didn't do that. And then the other three, they're accusing him of all kind of things. And then, thank God, Elihu showed up and just kind of told them all to shut up. He said, stand up, Job, we're going to talk about this thing. And he presented grace to Job. I've come instead of God. In other words, he would, we know that was Christ. And then God met him in a whirlwind and said, Job, stand up. I'm going to show you some grace. Because in the position that Job was in, he didn't look like he got a lot of grace. Family was gone. He was probably he was a very wealthy man. All of his riches are gone, and he ended up sitting on the heap of ashes of his of probably his mansion that he was living in. He was sitting on the on the uh, ash heap, and then remember, Satan comes to God and says, "Now I'll really make him." deny you if you'll let me touch his body. Because remember, God told him at first, he said, you can touch all of his possession, but don't touch his body. Then he's come back to him and he said, okay, you can touch his body, but you can't take his life. So here is um, Job scraping boils off of his skin, and he doesn't look like he's got a lot of grace. But now watch what happens in the analogy of Job, like we're going to see in the analogy of Boaz and Ruth, that we see that there was a place, and I'm sure Noah the same way, Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Look, he he had to do something to get God's attention. Same way with God saying, hey, have you considered my servant Job? Satan said, well, you got a hedge around him. I'll make him curse you. I'll make you just take that hedge away. But now watch as you get to the very end of Job, what happened to Job, the grace of God comes on the scene, gives him seven more children, gives him double his cattle. In other words, if he was a billionaire, he became a multi-billionaire, but he had to go through the process. So you and I, and everything that we go through in our life, we have to go through a process. To me, grace is a process. Sure, it's unmerited favor, but you know what? It has to do with you on one end, asking God to do something for you. You say, no, that's unmerited favor. God just dumps it. Be careful. Be careful. That makes you self-righteous. And we don't have any self-righteousness. Now, we, we are righteous because God, see, we're righteous because of the grace that God gives us. Your grace is unmerited divine assistance given to humans. So it's not given to anybody else. A tree doesn't need grace. You and I are the only ones that need grace. Amen? Or the approval of God. So in Genesis 6, verse 8, Noah found approval in the eyes of the Lord. There was no one worthy. Why? Because he saw Job. I mean, he saw um, Noah. He saw Job. David. Talk about grace. He was the apple of God's eye. And I'm reading in Psalms now, and you see that God loved David. But he didn't love David with filial love he loved him with agape love and agape love is what grace comes from grace comes from the agape love that that david i know the integrity of your heart i know what you really want to do and that's the same thing with me and you he want, he god knows what we really want when we ask him he knows that we might want to ask a miss he knows that we might want to ask for something that's not good But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. In other words, Noah, to me, Noah was praying, this whole scene of Noah is that he's praying to God that, God, you're going to have to do something with this this world because it's gone to pot. It's, It's getting worse and more evil every day. So Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord, and it didn't change. You know, Like I said before, prayer changes things, but... He knew what Noah, that Noah would be the one that would ask for grace, that would ask for mercy, that would ask for the approval of God. And so there Noah preached 120 years under grace. He was trying to give grace to the billions of people that was on the earth during the time of the, before the flood. And that's exactly what you and I, when we preach the message of the hour, when we preach Christ, that is grace being extended to me and you because we're the only ones that need it. And grace, listen, grace is not for the future. Grace is for what you've done. But now to God, he's covered us 
through eternal redemption, knowing that we would need grace. And the other side, like I said, man didn't develop grace. Noah didn't find grace in the eyes of the publicans and, and magistrates during no, he found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Brother Brown said he was a quack. They didn't, you know, he was preaching 120 years, it's gonna rain, and they're looking at him going, There ain't a cloud in the sky. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. And then Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord to continue on to build an ark. Because, listen, I believe God extends grace to everybody. Remember, it's unmerited. But it's whether you accept it. But remember the pardon. The pardon is not. Because what is a pardon? Grace. A pardon is grace. There was grace extended to that guy that killed the person and all that. The part that Brother Brown talks about. The story about the Abraham Lincoln signing the pardon, and he said, "All oh, this is no good." That was his grace. That was his approval. He was going to be that whole part of him being a murderer was going to be done away with, but he didn't accept it. Same way with me and you. If we don't accept grace, but now remember, it can't be greasy grace or disgrace. It's got to be amazing grace. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. So let's go to Exodus. 33 verse 13. Now this is a man named Moses and this man named Moses wanted to see God. He wanted to see this man he'd been talking to for all these years because here we're at Exodus 33. They're into the wilderness journey and said, Now therefore I pray thee, if I have found grace in thy sight, in other words, if I have found favor or approval, and that's the way I want you to think about it today. If you have done, it's like <clears throat> Brother Brown says, and I'll, I'll bring the quote later on. He says, when you've done all you can do, stand. When you've done everything you can do, stand right there. Because you know what? Grace is not that you're better than somebody else. Grace is not that you're worse than somebody else. Grace is unmerited favor, but God knows in your heart what you want. For a situation, because this is what Moses wanted for this situation. He said, Lord, if I found grace in your sight, show me now thy way that I may know thee, that I may find grace in thy sight, or favor, or acceptance, and consider that this nation is thy people. And the Lord said, My presence shall go with thee, and I will give thee rest. But Moses wasn't satisfied with that. He just didn't want the presence. Listen to verse 15. And he said unto him, If thy presence go not with me, carry us not up hence. That's pretty bold. But you know what he's doing? He's taking God at his word because God said, I'll take these people out by a mighty hand and I'll put them in the promised land. That's what you and I got to believe for everything, even all the way up to the resurrection and the rapture. You've got to believe that God's already said it and then that's the place that we're going to go to. Amen? Amen. And then what? You'll find favor in the eyes of the Lord. To me, this whole, we look at grace different ways, but I, just in a nutshell, keep this in your mind. In a nutshell, to me, grace is adoption. Because we found full favor in adoption. We found full favor that where God knows that if you have something in your heart to ask for it, it's going to be for the well-being of the people, the bride of Jesus Christ. Same way with what's, a, what's adoption, being able to speak and God being able to react. Well, now that's exactly what Moses is doing. Moses said, God, if I've found favor, in other words, if I've done everything that I've been told to do, if I've found grace in your sight, I want to see who you are. For within shall it be known, verse 16, here that I and thy people have found grace in thy sight. Is it not in that thou goest with us, question mark, so shall we be separated, I and thy people, from all the people that are upon the face of the earth. Look at verse 17. And the Lord said unto Moses, I will do this thing also that thou hast spoken. Now, there's adoption. I will do what you spoke. Because you've met the requirements of the day. You've met the acceptance of the hour that we're living in. That's what we've been speaking on, on eternal redemption. It has been on adoption. It has been on coming to speaking terms and that God can honor what you say and it's really God speaking it, but you and I are going to have to be the vessel that it goes through. Same way with Moses. So shall we be separated, I and thy people, from all the people that are upon the face of the earth. 
And the Lord said unto Moses, I will do this thing also that thou hast spoken, for thou hast found grace or acceptance in my sight, and I know thee by name. Now listen, he knew Moses before the foundation of the world. It wasn't that he just realized, well, this is Moses. No, he knew Moses, but what did Moses do? Moses had, Moses had come into a position that his name implied. Everybody talks about new name and all these different things. You know, you become a Christian. When you become a Christian, that puts you in a new order. That puts you in a new family. That puts you in a new way of thinking. Yeah. Amen? It's because you find grace in the eyes of the Lord. Yeah. And I know thee by name. And he said, I beseech thee, show me thy glory. And then we know that what did God do? God walked by and showed him the back part of, him, of his theophany and showed that it was a man. All right? So... Here we're talking about grace. We're also talking about position. So let's go to Ruth 2, verse 8. <clears throat> because I don't want grace just to be, well, it's unmerited favor, and then throw it out there. There's a lot to do with grace. God thought enough. He said it 160-something times in the Scripture. And Brother Branham, he said, my whole makeup is what? Grace. We'll bring those quotes later on. But listen to this, Ruth 2, verse 8. Then Boaz said unto Ruth, Hearest thou not, my daughter? Go not to glean in another field, neither go from hence, but abide here fast by my maidens. Now listen, he did not know Ruth personally at this time. But watch this. Let thine eyes be on the field that they do reap, and go thou after them. Have I not charged the young men that they shall not touch thee? Thank God. Touched you with a denominational idea or touched you with some wrong. That's what God's doing. Remember, this is the bride in Christ. This is a total example of the bride in Christ. Everybody got that? <clears throat> and when thou art athirst. Now look, this is the thing. Now listen, this message in this Bible is not do's and don'ts, but it does have a lot to do with what you do and a lot to do with what you don't. Okay? Everybody got that? Then look, but he tells her what to do in verse 9. All right? Don't go in another field. I'll give you everything you need right here. In other words, I'll give you the word of God you need and drink of that which the young men have drawn. Verse 10, Then she fell on her face and bowed herself to the ground and said unto him, Why have I found grace in thine eyes? You ever asked the Lord that? Yeah, you have. You should have. You said, Lord, why me? Well, there's a purpose behind all that. Why have I found grace in thine eyes? that thou shouldest take knowledge of me, seeing I am a stranger. Remember, they'd never met, but watch Christ, watch Boaz. Boaz had done his homework. He didn't, she didn't just happen upon Boaz and then he just said, well, I think you're a pretty girl. And No, he did some checking up on her. In other words, he was watching her before she knew he was watching her. Amen. And Boaz answered and said unto her, It hath fully been showed me all that thou hast done unto thy mother-in-law since the death of thine husband. Now, hold on a minute. The husband died in Moab. Moab. The husband had died way out there in the world, yet he somehow, Boaz, had some spies that could what has watched her the whole time. Wow. Thank God for that. Thank God we had a Boaz to do the same thing. And how thou hast left thy father and thy mother and the land of thy nativity and art coming to a people which thou knewest not heretofore. In other words, you come into a Christian realm. But now watch this. The Lord recompense thy work and a full reward be given thee of the Lord God of Israel under whose wings Thou art come to trust. The Lord recompensed thy work. Because she didn't raise up and say, No, I don't think I want to glean here. I think I want to glean somewhere else. No, I really don't want the water that you give me. I think I'll get my own. I don't want to do this and I don't want to do that. No, that Ruth, the bride, should not have that attitude. Our attitude is, is what the Lord gives us. That's what we should take. Amen. Be happy in what the Lord's give us. And then what's he going to do? Then you take him at his word, and then he has to fulfill his word by doing what Boaz said. He said, look, just stay in my field. You ain't got nothing to... This whole story is that a strange woman comes into the field, and Boaz 
already knows who she is. And he gives her grace. She says, how do I find grace in thine eyes that you should take knowledge of me, seeing I'm a stranger? He said, the Lord recompense thy work and a full reward be given thee of the Lord God of Israel under whose wings musicians come. Thou art come to what? Trust. See, grace works on trust. And that's where we go back to adoption works on trust. If he can't trust you with going forward, he's not going to give it to you because he's not going to give something out there and then it return void. He said everything he had, he would give, and it would never return void. It would accomplish. And that's what Boaz was saying. Ruth, stay right here. Do the things you're supposed to do. Stay in the Bible. Stay in the message of the hour. And I, Christ, will look over you and make sure that everything's okay. You have found grace in my eyes. In other words, acceptance or favor. And that's what you and I want to do now. We want to find favor in the eyes of God. So our prayer life, our reading our Bible, the different things that we do. But remember, it can never be greasy grace. If it's greasy grace, that's sin and that's actually iniquity. That's knowing to do better and you don't do it or not doing it if you know you're supposed to. Amen? But Ruth did exactly what Boaz suggested. And he said, well, I've done seeing you. I've seen you for, for years. I've been watching over you for years. And you found grace in my eyes. That's my question. It will be the next couple of services. Have you found grace in the eyes of the Lord? Right. Amen. Musicians, go ahead and play.